Hello, everyone. My name is Sid Melcher. I'm Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Western Massachusetts, and I welcome you to today's Instant Issues online event on climate change and global insecurity. Um, to increase accessibility of our programming uh, to people with visual impairments, I'm going to briefly describe myself. I am a white woman in my early 60s. I have short brown hair and I'm wearing glasses. Um, I understand that you have a lot of ways to spend your time and I'm grateful that you're here with us now. Um, I'm gonna begin by thanking our event sponsors, Glenn Meadow, Sir Speedy and Wilbraham and Munson Academy. And we remain grateful to NAI Plotkin 1350 Main Street LLC, which provides us with office and event space. The latter we hope to begin using again later this year in person when we are able to. We are also partnered with Valley Eye Radio, which rebroadcasts the audio from this program uh, for their listeners with visual impairments. We have two more Instant Issues events coming up in the next few weeks. On Thursday, February 17th, Politico Magazine contributing editor uh, Bill Scher will be speaking on He Saved the World, Edwards, Statinus, and the Creation of the UN. And then author Konstantin Plashekov will speak on Russian foreign policy in 2022 on Wednesday, March 9th, also at noon. If you are not currently receiving our emails, uh, I encourage you to go to our website at WAC westma.org and subscribe to get more information about these and other events. Our moderator this afternoon is Dr. Kavita Corey, Ruth Lawson Professor of Politics and Director of the McCulloch Center for Global Initiatives and a member of the World Affairs Council Board of Directors and a former Instant Issues speaker herself. She brought Dr. Omar Dahi to our attention and we are grateful to her for it. I'm gonna ask you and Kavita Corey will remind you that if over the course of this event, you have any questions to please type them into the Q and A um, rather than in chat and please don't raise your hand. We're just going to be reading questions. So I will now turn you over to Dr. Kavita Corey and she will introduce you to our guest. Many thanks. Thanks Sidna. It's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague uh, from the five colleges, Professor Omar Dahi. Professor Dahi is an Associate Professor of Economics at Hampshire College, where he also serves on the Board of Trustees. He is a Research Associate at the Political Economy Research Institute at UMass Amherst, and is the Founding Director of Security in Context, a research network on peace, conflict, and international relations. I'm sure Professor Dahi will be speaking more about this project. But let me just say a few words. It's a multi-sided project, bringing together scholars, researchers, and practitioners from the Middle East, Europe, and the US. The aim of this project is to advance critical and multidisciplinary perspectives on security, particularly from the global south, perspectives that are often marginalized, if not completely ignored. I am going to give you a little bit of a plug here for this project and for the terrific multimedia resource that it is for both research and teaching, because I've used a lot of the material on your website, uh, Professor Dahi, for my own classes and in my own research. Professor Dahi's research and scholarship addresses some of the most pressing issues in global politics today, namely economic development, international trade, post-conflict recovery, and critical security studies. He has published widely in major academic outlets, such as the Journal of Development Economics, Political Geography, Middle East Report, and Forced Migration Review. He is the co-author of the book, South-South, Trade and Finance in the 21st Century, Rise of the South, or a Second Great Divergence, which was published in 2017. At Hampshire, Professor Dahi teaches highly topical and timely courses on Middle East economies, economics of peace building, economic development, and South-South relations. In addition to his research and teaching, Professor Dahi has served on the UN Economics and Social Commission on West Asia's National Agenda for the Future of Syria program. 
Before uh, Professor Dahi begins his remarks, let me please remind you to put your questions in the Q&A and we will take as many of them as time permits. Professor Dahi will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes and then we'll move into the Q&A section of this program. Thank you very much for joining us and let me turn it over to Professor Dahi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me here today. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the council for the kind invitation. I'd like to thank Ms. Cynthia Melcher for her support and patience with me and my schedule as we uh, arrange this. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Kavira Khoury who helped make this happen and uh, for the very, very, very generous introduction uh, that she just mentioned about myself and about uh, security in context. Uh, it's great to be here in the Council. I've been a fan of the work of the Council for several years, and uh, uh, many of my colleagues, friends, and mentors have been involved or have spoken here, including Professor Corey. So it's really an honor to follow them. <clears throat> and I also see that you have a great lineup coming up. As Professor Corey mentioned, what I'd like to do today is introduce a research initiative, uh, Security in Context, that I co-founded along with colleagues in the US and abroad. And uh, really what we're trying to do, the way we define it, the way we talk about it is that we're trying to advance a critical non-Western security studies. So what I'd like to do today in the brief time that I have is to explain what we mean by that, what is uh, critical non-Western security studies entail, uh, and then shed light as to why uh, I think, uh, and we think this um, approach is needed through two examples um, that um, I think give us a sense of uh, the urgency and, and the need to think critically about how we receive and how we understand questions of security. The first example is about the Syrian conflict and the relationship between climate change and the Syrian conflict. And the second has to do with the US and Western response to the Arab Spring. I know I don't have much time, so I'll, I'll see uh, where I am in, in the talk. And, and perhaps if I don't get to some things, I look forward to discussing them or any questions or thoughts that you might have in the Q&A, in the discussion session. Um, I'm really interested in your thoughts as well. So let me start by the first point that I wanted to make, which is what do we mean uh, by a non-Western security studies? And over the past several months, I've been really trying to articulate and think through what is it that brought all the people in this network together? Um, and uh, really the way I think about it and the way I'd like to present it is that uh, there's really no unifying model. There's no one theory. Uh, if you've, you know, you know about security studies or you've heard or you're in the field and even critical security studies, there's sort of Copenhagen school and Paris school and a sort of traditional realist theory and uh, other approaches. Um, this is not what uh, this network is all about. Uh, rather than one unifying model, there's a diversity of disciplinary interest. But I think of uh, what we do, or I try to articulate what we do as the intersection of three critiques. So rather than, than one approach, think of a Venn diagram of three overlapping circles. And our approach is at the center of these three circles. And each of them represent a critique that I'm gonna sort of mention briefly. The first circle or the first set of critiques uh, that, that defines, I think, what we have in common is that, um, it's uh, a security studies where the referent object is not the West or Western states. So we think about uh, traditional approaches is US national security, UK national security, uh, where the referent object in traditional security studies, and even I would say in some critical security studies, uh, the referent object is the West. And deeper even than the question of the referent object, I would say there's a critique of the Western gaze the Western gaze on security. And what I mean by what the Western gaze is that it's uh, the gaze of someone looking from DC or New York, looking out the, at the world and identifying threats and areas of trouble potentially to the US, areas that require or do not require attention or debating the merits of this or that intervention and what it would mean for the US, what are the costs of doing or not doing something um, that's what I refer to as the US or the Western gaze. Uh, looking at, for example, what China's purchase of land or a new contract in the Belt and Road, what does it mean for US geopolitical rivalry? 
our approach is a critique of this Western gaze that, I, that we think is prevalent in security studies and international relations, and even in the everyday language of popular culture of how media and, and other sort of commonsensical approaches to looking at security uh, have. Um, and the key aspect of this is that this gaze is often a militarized gaze. It's a securitized gaze. It's a gaze that is identifying threats more often than not, uh, and then searching for solutions that, again, more often than not, end up being security-oriented solutions or militarized solutions to the uh, so-called identified, identified threats. And of course, one need not be just in DC to have that gaze, and simply not being from the West or being located somewhere else doesn't mean you don't have that gaze. Rather, uh, as I mentioned, there's a sort of disciplinary unconscious in the words of one of my colleagues, Samir Aboud, a disciplinary unconscious that produces the gaze through the types of journals, modes of thinking, approaches, themes, uh, things that are considered legitimate objects of analysis in security studies, and, and ignoring or marginalizing perspectives or ideas that are not considered legitimate approaches. So what we'd like to do is produce knowledge that we think is richer, more representative of the social reality or the insecurities of societies in the global South the, who, who are pursuing questions of social justice, human development, liberation, gender emancipation on their own terms, rather than what it means to uh, uh, threats uh, perceived from, from the West. So that's the sort of first set of the critique. And that brings me to the second circle or the second critique in this imaginary diagram, which is, uh, that we embrace disciplinary and methodological diversity. Uh, so it's not just one field, one traditional uh, mode of thinking, which is a sort of international relations, realist or liberal schools of thought, but there's a very wide number uh, of disciplines that are represented. Those include what we can, let's say, identify as traditional international relations or traditional security studies. Many people in our network uh, do IR, they do it from a critical perspective, but they do international relations. But we also have others who fit better within what we can say are global studies. Uh, so within our networks, we have uh, anthropologists, economists, and political economists, or people who study and research or are involved with activism around prisons, gender, sexuality, and masculinity studies, urban studies, post-colonial, and cultural studies. Uh, the themes that are studied in our networks include the political economy of security, the insecurity of everyday life, technologies of surveillance and data capture, borders, displacement, migration, the geopolitics of knowledge production, and many, many other themes. Um, and what we'd like to do in our network is to encourage uh, particularly young researchers and journalists and, and scholars who are interested in these fields to basically um, encourage their own intrinsic curiosity, in, in, uh, in, encourage their own sort of inquiry-based analysis. Uh, many young scholars coming up uh, both in the Middle East or across different regions who want to study security studies uh, feel like they have to fit their perspectives and their thinking within one mold. Uh, and that is the, again, the very traditional approach to security studies. And a lot of what we do in addition to public engagement, in addition to public policy, is mentorship of uh, a scholar is to say that their own knowledge uh, and their own interests are legitimate and, and we can provide platforms and, and sort of engagement for them to develop their own interests and curiosity. Uh, the third circle, uh, which is perhaps uh, more self-consciously political or the third critique that I think unites this group is uh, what I would say is a moral critique. It's a moral critique of the global order. It's a moral critique of the legacies of Western interventions, neo-colonialism, imperialism, US hegemony, global capitalism that has often resulted in severe insecurities in and for societies of the global South. The, the production often, investments in security for some countries uh, have produced significant insecurity uh, through militarized, securitized, political, uh, and other forms of intervention. But this critique is also equally skeptical of the, of the so-called rise of the South, which is to say challenges to the West coming from rising powers, uh, non-Western and sometimes explicitly anti-Western powers, uh, 
who themselves have their own militarized, securitized practices. Uh, many of those countries also have, in, in even their, they, they have now think tanks and they fund research centers that call themselves non-Western approaches to security studies. But we often see that they themselves advocate highly militarized, highly securitized interventions that have uh, significantly uh, negative effects on uh, populations of the regions that, that, that those countries are in. And in addition to this commitment to the moral critique, as with all the other critiques, there is, of course, an equal commitment to seek out and to highlight alternatives that exist. There are always people, movements, activists, practitioners, and, and scholars engaged in um, uh, critiquing, but also uh, producing and working on alternatives. And we see among our role is to shed light and provide a platform for those uh, people to articulate their views. Uh, and, and really a big part of, of our thinking is not that we're producing new thought that isn't out there, but we're providing an infrastructure and a basis for all of these critiques to be highlighted so that we learn from, from each other, but we also amplify our voices uh, to produce alternative narratives and discourses on these, um, on these issues. So that's in brief what I think uh, the network that uh, sort of brings us together and perhaps towards the end of my talk, I'll, I'll sort of share my screen and, and show the, the website of the initiative. Um, and you can check it out. It's securityincontext.com, one word, securityincontext.com. Sign up for our mailing list. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a lot of work uh, that I can go in more detail in the discussion uh, on, on what we're doing. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do for the rest of the time that I have is to provide two examples of um, uh, cases from, from my own research that I think amplify or sort of manifest why we need new thinking about security. And you know, what are the problems that we're trying to, or what are the issues that we're trying to critique or engage with? And uh, uh, one of them you may already be familiar with. The first example comes from the Syrian conflict. And uh, as you know, the, there's been a destructive uh, conflict in Syria for the past decade. The conflict has resulted in uh, hundreds of thousands of, of deaths, uh, millions of displaced people. Uh, it's become a regional and international conflict with the presence of multiple um, forces from various countries. Uh, in, in some ways, the conflict is winding down, but it is very much still a humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, I was born and raised in Syria and, and have very um, significant ties to the country uh, in terms of, of course, personal ties that, uh, that I continue to have, but also uh, professional and uh, academic and really an ethical commitment. And a lot of my research over the past 10 years uh, has really attempted to engage with the uh, understanding the conflict from an academic perspective, but also being involved from a policy perspective on engaging in ways to uh, mitigate and end the conflict and pursue uh, potentially questions of what would a just solution mean? What would peace building imply? Uh, but the example I want to give is uh, and has to do with uh, the relationship between the Syrian conflict and climate change. And you may already have heard of this, but basically over the past, um, around the years of 2012, 2013, 14, there was the rise of this idea that the uh, Syrian conflict was due to climate change and that a big part of the conflict was due to a three-year drought in 2000, between 2006 and 2009, uh, and that this drought uh, triggered massive internal migration and uh, millions of Syrians from places where there was a drought um, basically uh, migrated away from those areas and went into cities. And uh, after they went into these cities that put a tremendous uh, pressure on the infrastructure and that spilled over into protests and demonstrations. And this idea, what, what we call the Syrian climate change thesis, was picked up by various Western policymakers and commentators. And really, it really sent, uh, was said and, and really, in, in, in uh, their view, solidified this idea that anthropogenic climate change has become a um, threat multiplier. So. President Barack Obama at the time claimed that climate change related drought, uh, quote, helped fuel the early unrest in Syria, which descended into civil war. Uh, 
John Kerry said, it's not a coincidence that immediately prior to the civil war in Syria, the country experienced its worst drought on record. Uh, Bernie Sanders, even Prince Charles, other international organizations, governmental reports, defense think tanks, and also left-leaning liberal academics and activists, both of the left and right center have argued similarly. Uh, and, and really it, it uh, was not important for many of, of those just on their own, but it tended to basically lend credibility to the warnings that you know, we are in the era of climate-driven instability. Uh, and so we have, there's important policy implications uh, for the way we deal with climate change. Um, now, this was a plausible claim, uh, but there are several problems with it. And the first problem with it, to be very direct, is that there's no evidence for this claim. Uh, and this is something I pursued along with um, several colleagues, Jan Selby, Mike Holb, and Christian Froelich. We, we published uh, an article about this uh, several years ago, where we really tried to examine all the evidence that exists. And we found that there's really no credible evidence. Um, there was one year of, I, I won't go into too much detail, I'm happy to discuss this in the, in the Q&A. Uh, there was one year of unprecedented drought in Syria in 2007, 2008. Uh, that itself made the three-year average very, very low, but um, rain rebounded and production of agricultural products rebounded after that. Um, the, the internal migration that was claimed to be in the millions of people that migrated to the drought did not exist. Millions of people migrating inside Syria would mean that you know, all provinces in the north uh, east of Syria would have been hollowed out. But the maximum uh, number that we actually found that was uh, more than usual migration due to the drought was 300,000 people. That a, that's a, was a generous estimate. Um, nowhere near the, the, the wild claims. And there was really no evidence that these people only went to cities where the early unrest began. Alternatively, during this time, the, during this time period, the 10 years that preceded the, um, uh, the, uh, the war in Syria, the conflict in Syria, the biggest, more than usual, internal displacement of people that is not the season, you know, there's always seasonal migration. Uh, but the biggest uh, internal displacement or the biggest uh, over uh, than usual population displacement was the displacement of 2 million Iraqi refugees who moved to Syria in the aftermath of the US invasion. Um, of course, no one claims that the US invasion of Iraq uh, directly led to the Syrian conflict, and no one should make that claim, but if we're looking about population being displaced, this was the uh, population that, the biggest sort of population that was displaced inside Syria, and of course these were not even Syrians, they were Iraqis coming, uh, you know, they were coming from, from a neighboring country. This type of research and the attention that the climate change uh, thesis gathered, which is of course very legitimate, uh, did, did marginalize a lot of other alternative hypotheses as to why there were refugees showing up in Europe that were being called climate refugees. So a lot of the displaced Syrians were started being labeled as climate refugees, climate migrants. Um, and that also includes the heavy, heavily militarized uh, intervention into the Syrian conflict, um, which uh, the regional countries were heavily implicated in, including Turkey, including the Gulf countries, Iran, of course, but also the West was directly implicated in, in billions of dollars of weapon sales, which transformed the conflict in Syria from an uprising into a regional and proxy war. Um, so there's a sort of narrative that took hold and a narrative that, that was absent. And I think uh, this points to a broader problem. Uh, as Betsy Hartman and, and Hendrickson have written, uh, we need to think carefully about um, how these mobilizations of environmental threat multipliers and, and uh, uh, risk factors are mobilized. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, in, in our uh, desire and in the legitimate um, um, aim of confronting climate denialism, Sometimes environmental activists and scholars in the global north often play the national security card as a sort of desperate countermeasure to keep climate change on the national policy agenda. Uh, 
uh, by saying climate change is going to cause wars, climate change is going to cause refugees. Uh, the downside of that is that it mobilizes these discourses of threats and narratives, which in turn, uh, off, more often than not, lead to heavy securitized responses. And as we saw in the Europe, the rise of sort of right wing backlash uh, to, to much of these. Um, this is not, of course, all due to, to this claim, but the idea that um, I think oftentimes uh, the narratives that take hold have significant uh, uh, dangers and downsides that we really need to be aware of. The second and maybe more important example that I'll end with uh, in these last uh, five minutes that I have, and I hope uh, Professor Corey will, will let me speak for this last five minutes uh, on this, uh, which is a broader point that I think um, sheds light on the lack of um, Western strategic thinking about um, uh, security and insecurity in, in the global South. Um, in 2010, 2011, not only was there an uprising in Syria, but of course there was an uprising in Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Libya, other countries. And Egypt, as many of you know, is the largest uh, Arab speaking country, uh, perhaps the most important historically. And Egypt was witnessing in 2011, the first democratic transition in its history, first democratic elections in its history. And so in 2011, the G8, which are the richest countries in the world, uh, met, uh, and the G8 includes uh, the US, UK, Germany, France, uh, Canada, Italy, Japan, I think included Russia at that time. And they met and they decided to give to the three countries, Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya, $40 billion in aid. That was the sum they came up with at that time. And this was picked up at that time by several observers, including Juan Cole and, and uh, Stephen Walt, uh, to, to name two uh, quite well-known uh, scholars. And the $40 billion in aid that they pledged was not even going to come from all of those countries. Instead, the G8 from themselves promised $10 billion in aid, asked Saudi Arabia to pledge $10 billion, and said that $20 billion, the remaining $20 billion to make up the 40 would come from the World Bank and the African Development Bank. Now, Egypt's debt at that time was $80 billion, and Tunisia's debt was $50 billion. Um, let's compare this just to sort of put these figures in perspectives, and this is an exercise that, I, uh, uh, that Stephen Walt did at that time, with the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan, which we all know, the reconstruction of Europe, uh, cost the US about $13 billion in 1948. And at that time, the US economy was only about $270 billion. So the Marshall Plan amounted to 5% of US GDP, which if the, if the US was to pledge a similar percentage of its GDP in 2011 to those three countries, it would have been around $700 billion. Instead, technically, they only pledged $10 billion. And of course, no one would have expected the same amount of support as the Marshall Plan, but even a much, much smaller amount, uh, a 10% of the Marshall Plan would have been a number that was seven times more than the number they pledged. Today, 5% of US GDP is $1 trillion, which is, which is uh, you know, something that, that the US is unable to pass for domestic purposes, let alone in, in international aid, to sort of compare the different sort of eras that we're in. And of course, there was precedent in supporting these countries. And the biggest precedent in supporting Egypt, for example, was in the aftermath of the first Gulf War in 1990 and 1991 in um, repayment or to basically reward Egypt for joining the US coalition to liberate Kuwait, half of all of the Egyptian national debt was wiped out. It was 50 billion, it was reduced to 25 billion by the US given its influence in the IMF and in the international financial markets as a reward for its sort of participation in the Gulf War. Yet, in the first democratic transition in that country, there was no more than $10 billion that was offered to support democracy, a conditionality that could have uh, reduced significantly Egyptian debt that could have supported the democratic transition. Of course, we know that the wars of the US in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Syria and Iraq over the last 20 years if you look through the, the various estimates that have made amount to around 
$4 trillion over the past 20 years. Maybe that's a little bit, I, I don't know uh, uh, if that's, a, uh, uh, it's actually a little bit more than that. It's $4.3 trillion. But basically, if we take the rough uh, number of $4 trillion, that comes to around $16 billion per month over the past 20 years spent on pursuing the US wars, whereas the, the support for democracy was a paltry 10 to $40 billion. Um, basically, the, the, uh, I think these two small examples that I tried to uh, share, I think show a little bit of uh, why um, we think new types of, of approaches, practices, policies of security are needed that are less militaristic, less securitized, uh, and more human development, more solidarity oriented. And, and this is what I think uh, we hope to bring uh, um, through our initiative and uh, look forward to discussing with you. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Professor Dahi. Uh, we've got a couple of questions. So let me start, start out with this. The first question is from Faris al Khurusi, who's writing from uh, Oman. And his question has to do with um, OECD countries and oil production. Over the last century, something like 70% of carbon has been produced in typically Western OECD countries and their manufacturing base in China. And hence the discourse has been driven from that historical context. Since China and India have not been shy in imposing their energy policy, how quickly do you believe energy producers, including countries like Syria, which many international uh, uh, scholars forget is a hydrocarbon producer, will have to pivot their priorities to Beijing and New Delhi? Thank you so much. And it's great to see uh, my old friend Faris asking this question. He's an expert himself on, on this topic. I'd love to, to hear his perspective. I think this is a really interesting um, question to think of more broadly of you know, uh, the question of decarbonization, uh, the question of what kind of energy policies that are going to be pursued. And there's a big debate, of course, within the um, within the uh, academic community, practitioner, NGO community, uh, back and forth. And I would say there was a series of very good articles in foreign policy on this debate by uh, some, um, uh, some researchers from the Breakthrough Institute in, in California that highlighted the, um, the fact that there is a Western driven narrative of carbon neutrality and decarbonization that is important, but that is violated by often these countries. So, you know, Germany built, you know, burned more fossil fuels last year than it did three years ago. It's burning more than less fossil fuels. Norway is pursuing, uh, of course, uh, one of the biggest oil, oil and natural gas producers, uh, sort of pursuing a decarbonization and uh, sort of policy in, in the third world. And I think um, oftentimes, and I think, uh, Today, in the policy discussions, there's a lot of emphasis on the need to decarbonize um, economies of uh, you know, poor countries like India and, and other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and perhaps in the rebuilding of Syria, uh, that there will be that, that emphasis to, to sort of uh, um, adopt a, a decarbonized approach. The first thing to say is that that approach is sound for those countries. I mean, it's in those countries' interests to grow uh, by um, adopting um, uh, renewable energy, uh, solar energy by not burning more fossil fuels, not least of which due to the fact like in the case like Syria, for example, there's been an incredibly toxic and environmentally destructive legacy of, of the conflict. Uh, and this is something that um, will, will leave an effect for, for many generations really. Uh, but to me, that also creates an opportunity for a uh, green revival in Syria that is not just a luxury but a necessity. So putting people to work to to essentially help address this toxic legacy, putting people to work to reconstruct in more green uh, friendly approaches. So all of that, of course, is um, is is needed. The other thing to say is that um, you know the idea that they will, uh, I think, China and um, 
India will impose their policies. I don't think that's necessarily accurate. There's a lot of emphasis on renewable energy in China, despite the fact that, of course, they're a big they're a carbon producer. But I would say more broadly is that it's not realistic for many of those countries um, to uh, who have significant energy needs to think that they're going to be the leaders in decarbonization. I think the West has to be the leader in decarbonization. Renewable energy, as important as it is, and there is to be, of course, significant more investment in making it cheaper and more accessible, but both solar energy, renewable energy, wind is not sufficient to really meet the needs of those countries that on a per capita basis really uh, actually contribute significantly less than, than Western countries. So this is a really important topic, and I'm, I'm curious to hear Faris's thoughts on this, but I think it is both those countries' interests in leading green non-toxic, non-fossil fuel uh, revival, but it's not realistic to really think that the poor countries, including Syria and, and other countries, including India, will be able to meet what I think is legitimate growth needs for their populations solely through renewable energy. Great, thank you very much. If I can sort of follow up a little bit on your remarks to uh, Professor Dahi, uh, your work focuses on Syria. And so I'm wondering if you could say a little bit in terms of where you see the conflict at this point in time, given that it's sort of dropped off out of you know, news and media, certainly in this country. So what do you think are the sort of the, the major sort of challenges at this point and where, how you think uh, policymakers should be approaching this conflict and, and, and where, where it stands and how we should be addressing it, given your own sort of emphasis on alternative approaches. And you've talked here about sort of green revival as an example of how one might deal with these toxic legacies, to use your words. So if you could sort of say a little bit more about that. Sure, thank you so much. Um, so um, the first thing to say is that we can consider the conflict in Syria now as, as a frozen conflict. This is the, the term, I guess, that is, is widely used on this, which is basically that the conflict is not ended. It has not had a um, consensus solution. Uh, there has been no peace accord, peace, um, uh, peace treaty between all the sides, or even, uh, you know, there isn't one on the horizon, uh, honestly. So it's a frozen conflict. There is There are Russian forces, Iranian forces, and US forces, as well as Turkish forces. These are the main international forces. They are spread geographically in different areas, so there are spheres of influence. Um, the Syrian government, of course, is supported by Russia and Iran. Uh, Turkey has its own sphere of influence. And US, along with uh, what you can call um, Kurdish-led political and military um, armed groups, are in the northeast of Syria, which also happens to be the, you know, speaking of energy, the area that has the most uh, sort of oil, uh, oil, oil wells, oil resources. So that's at the, the, the scene of the sort of where the conflict is overall. Um, and the conflict is no longer as important to the international countries and the regional countries as it was several years ago. So that's partly why it's frozen. It was a side of confrontation uh, between all those forces. And now there's, they decided not to solve it, but to freeze it. And there are bigger issues. There's the Iran nuclear accord being renegotiated. There's the Ukrainian-Russian confrontation right now. So it's in the interests not of Syrians, but of the big powers who freeze this conflict. Now, in terms of the major issues, let me divide them into three areas, the economic, the political, and the social uh, dimensions, very briefly. The economic dimension, we have a really a, 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 a ca catastrophic humanitarian economic condition. Uh, and I've been tracking this very closely a lot in, in the United Nations project that I'm involved with, and I just uh, uh, was the lead author of a report that's coming out in February. Um, that really deals with what are the most pressing issues uh, in, in the next term for Syria. So at the economic level, we've had, as a result of the conflict itself, as a result of the joint impact of the conflict, the sanctions that are imposed by unilateral, what's called unilateral coercive sanctions, they're not United Nations sanctions, they're imposed by the, uh, the US primarily and the European Union. Of course, the actions of the Syrian government itself uh, but also the regional economic freefall. There was a crisis in Lebanon, 
uh, a financial crisis in Lebanon, and of course there was the COVID pandemic. So all of those combined have um, caused a free fall in, in, um, in living standards, much worse than even things we saw at the height of the conflict. I mean, other than of course, the destruction that was happening directly there, the economic situation, uh, especially after the last few years when the, the armed conflict was winding down, so even though the frozen conflict is not an ideal solution, it was a better uh, on you know, human development than the actual active conflict, right? Because that was the levels of destruction and the death were reduced. Uh, but we really have an unprecedented uh, uh, situation now in, in Syria. And many of the people have nowhere to go because all countries have, have closed their borders to, to refugees. So it's a dire economic situation and there's an urgent need and I think the Biden administration, due to the pressure, not just from uh, a lot of experts, but also Syrian and international NGOs who work in the opposition areas, that the U.S. sanctions are not even allowing, uh, you know, opposition forces and opposition NGOs and European NGOs to, to work, and even the U.S. itself, because of the fact that there are issues like overcompliance by banks. It's, it's sort of banks don't want to risk uh, having the uh, OFAC office sort of uh, impose uh, huge sanctions on them. That's at the economic level. At uh, the social level, I think the, you know, the, the, this is a civil war and that has created a huge polarization among Syrians. Uh, there are entrenched positions, there are divisions. Uh, you know, the, when the Syrian conflict first started, we thought of you know, the opposition on the one side and the regime on the other, but it's actually that binary does not capture the wide uh, range of perspectives and polarization that exists in Syria. And I think there is increasing recognition by all sides that there has to be ways to start reconciliation efforts and reconciliation from the bottom up, which is not uh, sufficient, of course, without a major transformation there can, you know, at the political level there, you know, Many people won't feel comfortable returning to Syria, for example. Many of the refugees won't feel safe as long as the Syrian government is in power. But nevertheless, there are increasing attempts to try and highlight the fact that um, there are shared suffering among a lot of Syrians, um, to highlight basically, uh, you know, bringing together the collective memory, the, the positive shared experiences in, in Syrian uh, in Syria before 2011 as an attempt to really resolve the wounds of the war. But I think there's the question of justice. Whenever you think about social reconciliation, there is the problem of justice. And I think as long as that uh, question of justice, people don't see that uh, being addressed, um, you know, even truth, even actually a narrative where people can see themselves and, and again, there are different narratives here. There are people from the government perspective who believe this war is an international war against Syria. And of course, there are people who are against the government who see the brutality of, of the government. And both sides have truth to them. A lot of these narratives have partial truth to them, but they need to be treated as more than just completely true or completely false. They need to be treated as narratives that have meaning. They're part of the meaning making of Syrians. They, they, they need to make sense of the great amount of violence that has happened to them. And so we are trying and others are trying to sort of bridge these narratives slowly by, by um, creating platforms where uh, more um, inclusive voices, people who recognize each other's suffering can, can flourish and can really bring together Syrians. And I think there's a, there's a thirst within Syrian society for that. And the international community here can play a big role in elevating platforms for Syrian civil society there. So, uh, and then the, finally the political process. And I think that is where sort of bringing back to your question, what kind of policy interventions, I think the frozen conflict was better than the, the armed conflict continuing in terms of the destruction. But I think leaving this question uh, unresolved is problematic for all sorts of reasons. Problematic for Syrians, because as long as there's no serious movement the economic situation will deteriorate, the social polarization will continue, and new forms of conflict will emerge over resources. Because for example, there is now a lot of grievances that you know, there's one area that's controlled by Kurdish political forces and US that controls the oil wealth, for example, and their investments by the US in that area, whereas other areas within Syria are being you know, suffocated under the sanctions. That exacerbates the Arab-Kurdish divide, for example, that exacerbates issues that were not necessarily drivers of conflict, but have created new drivers of conflict. 
Um, there is a constitutional committee that meets in Geneva. It's made up of three groups, the government side, the opposition side, and the civil society platform. There has not been serious investment by all the sides, including the Syrian government, uh, in terms of really addressing the issue. And I think it's in all of those parties' self-interest to do so because the frozen conflict, the way I articulate it, is that it's an unstable equilibrium. In a sense, there's no war, but there could be because the you know there are Russian, U.S., Turkish, Syrian military uh, um, forces all in close proximity to each other. There are all sorts of grievances that need to be addressed, and without uh, a restarting of the political process, which would take U.S. and Russian and Iranian uh, willpower, of course, and and Turkish as well to make it happen. That isn't likely to happen, but we don't see that happening because as you, you know, the US and Russia are not about to now sit and discuss the, the Syrian issue. So, you know, in reality, the Syrians are a victim of, of all these sort of geopolitical great power conflicts that we see happening. Um, so that's in, in a nutshell or more than a nutshell, perhaps where we are in Syria. But I think in terms of, you know, what I would say to policy makers, I mean, the, the thing that we've been trying to say is first address the humanitarian situation. Uh, and that includes confidence building steps to just to sort of end on this because the big picture issues aren't going to be solved we can have small micro confidence building steps that are necessary so that the Syrian government to show it's serious to moving from the conflict to a non-conflict situation would release detainees it still detains and imprisons thousands and thousands of people there are many people who disappeared whose fate is not uh, clear their families want to know what happened to them many of them have been killed under under torture and 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 or have have been disappeared. So, uh, so in return to that, you know, there there can be an easing of the sanctions. There's a there's a number of confidence building measures that can happen to slowly move us from a an unstable to a stable equilibrium, and begin to think that actually there is a there's a serious interest in in moving towards uh, reviving the country at, at those levels. But they're interconnected. The political, social, and political. And, and economic are, are really interconnected. And that's why all of those need to be taken into account. Thank you very much. I, and you've presented a very sort of complex picture and I appreciate the way in which you've sort of broken down the conflict itself. I'm wondering if you can say a little bit more about sort of the regional interests and how sort of the regional powers are intersecting because we tend to look at this and I think rightly so to some extent in uh, US and Russia, you know, looking at their sort of intervention or how they might sort of deal with the conflict where it is, as you refer to it as a frozen conflict. What about the regional players? I mean, starting with countries like, like Turkey, like Saudi Arabia, I'm also thinking of sort of the situation in Lebanon right now. So what are some of the regional interests and how do they shape what is going on in places like Syria? That's a, that's a really good question. And here the answer is also complex because you have a situation where that binary of there's a, some groups that supported the opposition, some groups that supported the government has broken down. And the, you've seen the regional players have shifting priorities. So at the start of the conflict, the, the sort of rough idea is that uh, Turkey and several of the Gulf countries, primarily the United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Saudi Arabia supported the opposition and funded the opposition and empowered them and provided them with diplomatic, political, military support. And those countries are also, NATO is a, uh, Turkey is a NATO country and the Gulf countries have close ties with, with several of those have close ties with the US. Um, and uh, on the other hand, Iran and Hezbollah, the armed group in, in Lebanon supported the Syrian government and eventually Russia did first politically and diplomatically, but then through direct military intervention. So those are, this is the basic lay of the land. What complicates this is that pretty soon there was a divergence within the opposition, within the, within the forces that supported the opposition. Uh, and that had to do with divergence between Qatar and Turkey on one hand and, you, and Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates on the other. They increasingly were at odds with each other. They increasingly uh, backed different groups in the region. So um, uh, Turkey and Qatar were supporting the, the, the election of Mohammed Morsi in Egypt. United Arab Emirates and, and Saudi Arabia were increasingly at odds. And that has to do with uh, traditional 
suspicion and hostility between Saudi Arabia and the Muslim Brotherhood, because the, the, the easy way to put it is that there's sort of leadership of the Sunni Muslim um, uh, uh, group, I guess, or, or leadership within the Sunni Muslim community, uh, there, there's a rivalry there. And so um, Saudi Arabia and, and United Arab Emirates fostered coalitions with um, increasingly what they considered necessarily non-Islamic and secular forces like Sisi, for example. Um, and in the case of Syria, they back, they increasingly started backing different armed groups. So the situation got very, very complicated. And I would say that why, and of course, many of those Gulf countries, uh, United Emirates and Saudi Arabia, I had identified Iran as their primary regional threat. And, and therefore uh, were, uh, and this is an open, not a, not a secret that they've said this publicly and privately, and they've urged in, in the 2000s and, and, and the, uh, you know, the early years of the Gulf War for US more to be more forceful with and against Iran. However, in the past few years, countries like the Emirates have become, have shifted, I would say. They identified Turkey as perhaps a, a biggest rival and a threat. And therefore, uh, you've seen the Emirates, for example, reach out to the Syrian government and try to normalize ties. There is now increasing ties between the Emirates having initially back the opposition is now uh, mending ties and trying to bring the Syrian government back into the fold uh, in large part to push back against Turkish influence in Syria. So as you can see, they're really complex, uh, the politics there. Countries, uh, other countries have become and have been more neutral. And, and I think countries like Oman, for example, given that uh, my friend Faris is here, uh, has played and can play a very positive mediating role because they're not all countries were took a very strong uh, um, polarized and polarizing role in the conflict. And so countries like Oman have enough goodwill by, by other countries to sort of play more mediating roles, whether or not they choose to do so is another question. But, you know, there are ways in which now there's this process of shifting alliances. And in fact, there are signs that these many of these countries are trying to mend fences with, with each other and even with Iran, you know, reaching out to Iran. Again, all of this is, as I say, is an unstable equilibrium, but um, the alliances are complex and shifting. And I would say, you know, part of, of my, my own view is that, you know, these geopolitical rivalries, whether they escalate or they de-escalate, sometimes doesn't translate into benefits for the population. I mean, they might be at the expense of, you know, elite bargains don't necessarily lead to justice in the outcomes of civil conflicts. They lead to entrenchment, perhaps, of injustice. They lead to uh, um, a lack of, of a meaningful transition. Nevertheless, the situation is so dire that you want to see these, you want to see the regional powers not actively confronting each other, because at least that has a positive influence on, on the everyday life of people. Well, thank you very much. I think we only have a couple of minutes. So let me thank you very much, Professor Dahi, for your talk and your comments. And for really, I think, uh, enlightening us over here about conflicts that are deeply complex, dynamic, but also reminding us of the human costs and the human dimensions of war, which I think once sort of major powers withdraw, and I think in some senses, we're also seeing this in Afghanistan the human dimension is forgotten very quickly. And both sort of countries like Syria and Afghanistan and other places too are really suffering from the consequences of these major power conflicts. So thank you very much for your remarks and I'm going to turn it over to Sid again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Omar Dahi and Kavita Khoury and our um, audience today, um, I think, You've given us an enormous amount to think about um, and talk about. Um, so thank you all for participating today. And I hope to see you again in a couple of weeks at our next Instant Issues Online. Goodbye. <laughs>